I'm honored to introduce Nam Lee to all of you. His poetry has been published in numerous publications, including Poetry, the American Poetry Review, and the Paris Review. He has received major awards in the United States, Europe, and Australia, including the Penn Malamud Award, the Anisfield Wolf Book Award, the Dylan Thomas Prize, the Australian Prime Minister's Literary Award, and the Melbourne, Melbourne Prize for Literature. His short story collection, The Boat, has been republished as a modern classic and is widely translated, anthologized, and taught. Tonight, he will be talking about this new book-length work of poetry, 36 Ways of Writing a Vietnamese Poem. In using various forms and tones, he explores the writing that is born of the diaspora and the racism, oppression, and violence that comes along with it. In his praise of the book, the 2003 Nobel Laureate for Literature, J.M. Coetzea, writes that with a cool outsider's eye, he takes the English language to pieces and reassembles it with a virtuoso ease not seen since Finnegan's Wake. Nam Lee is a poet working at the height of his powers. Tonight, he will be in conversation with Natasha Sahe. Natasha was born stateless in Munich, Germany, and grew up in New York City and its suburbs. She is the author of five books of poems. Um, and she, she is the Professor Emerita of English at Westminster University in Salt Lake City, teaches in the Vermont College of Fine Arts MFA in Writing Program, and lives in Washington, D.C. Everyone, let us all welcome Nam Lee and Natasha Sai. Introduction. It's on. Is this louder? Okay. So Nam was born in 1978 in the southern part of Vietnam and emigrated, not emigrated, he was a refugee with his parents and his older brother, first to Malaysia and then to Australia. They ended up in Melbourne, and he was educated there. And my um, interest in him being a poet stems from the fact that he made an enormous splash with his first book of short stories, The Boat. I didn't realize until I looked it up that you actually wrote your uh, thesis on Auden in rhymed, in rhymed couplets or in iambic pentameter, yes. So how can someone who's such an accomplished um, fiction writer produce an amazing book of poems? Uh, so anyway, the poetry goes back longer than the fiction writing. Um, so uh, you just heard about the boat. I'll tell you a little bit more about this book. It's a postmodern formalist book. So each poem is takes a for a different form that not iambic pentameter. Well, although some have a meter, but they are visual as well as um, sonic, and some are one is numerical, and he anticipates all the objections you're going to have to the poems as you're reading them. So, for instance, how can you dare write a Vietnamese poet, poem, right? And then the next poem addresses that question in a very elegant way. So, I'm going to let you start reading, and then we'll have a conversation, and you might have questions, too. Well, I don't know. Fifteen minutes? Fifteen minutes? Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, thank you, Natasha, for that introduction. Um, thank you, Bernard, as well. Um, so this book, uh, as you know, is called 36 Ways of Writing a Vietnamese Poem, and the title of each poem uh, is one of those ways. I'll just read a um, uh, selection. One. Diasporic. In English, mind you, you think I write to Yikna me? Shame on you. It was your violence dumbed me, smeared me, reaved me. 
Your war I don't remember and won't let you forget. Moved me from place and sufficiency. From everything I didn't know, I didn't know, I would have known. You would have known. Displace meant everything to me before the power went home. Shame on me. What do I know? What's Vietnamese in me could fit in a poem? Two. Invocative. Apostrophic. To you, mind you, always, even if not, or not, facially, your language, your leash, my face, my pedigree, and you know I know my face, to a fault, to the ninth degree. Whatever I write is Vietnamese, I can never not, you won't let me not, lick the leash or bite it. Even at the end of my brain and yours, said transplanted lawns, outwash plains, son life, I am this face, no more. Whereas you are the living palm, the wind, the phoenix song, the house in my head I name home. Though where I'm really from, the dead bird stays dead. Three, ekphrastic, self-portrait, and it starts with a um, a really smudgy, blurry picture uh, of my maternal grandmother. Photo, right of blood, Mangwai, she in me, in me. Monochrome, tinge of colour decay. Note, spots and blotches a la calligraphic ink. Spilled logogram, smeared morphemes. Character cannot cohere. Note, overexposure, giving effect of flatness. Note, low contrast, giving effect of flatness. Note, lack of contour, giving effect of flatness, as if repeatedly photocopied from photocopies. Note clothing, French aoyai, silk if you like, with off-centred mandarin collar. It writes itself. Note face, full moon circle, rising from slim circle collar. Hair flat, conforming. Acceptant of, path of, totality. What the photo cannot say. Are her eyebrows painted tang green? Is that smudge on her brow actually gold foil in the Southern Dynasty style? Her unseen teeth, black lacquered. All in the look. Note expression. Inscrutable. Impassive. Passive as craters, scuffs on jade terrace. Now write about it what you like. Four, aegic, all encompassing. You can't go far wrong with violence. You'll go far, my boy. You'll cross oceans, my man. Start with the fall, go back or forth through bombs or boats across all the killing fields of thought. You can't make it up because it's all yours by blood, by right, by wrong done to your blood. Hold to trauma, even if it never happened to you. You may claim it. Your blood contains it. What happened to them, your parents, theirs, or their kin, who don't talk about it because of what happened to them, is yours to take 
and tell. Their harm, your hurt. You may write it, for it is written in the very walls of your souls. This is a, a longish one. I've skipped a couple, um, and I might stop after this. Seven. Violence, pedo effective, slam declension. But think about the children, super cute children, mute children, with uncommonly big eyes, children with hard eyes, eyes that have seen what no child's eyes should see, children naked as the day, wearing big smiles and no smiles preternaturally wise, with mooned out tummies and cleft palates and cataracts, deformities and birth defects, children in an instant blown up, grown up, orphaned, homeless, hard up, hopped up, ganged up, pimping on bright continental terraces and in dark dingy rooms, their bang bang sisters, who are children too, all children, of GI boom boom, of R&R, &R, Rock and ruin, rape and run. And have you ever fucked a green man, girl? You'll fly so high you'll see stars going boom, 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 boom. Or some of them somehow break free. You'll see them in red crescented refugee camps with bowl cuts and fly swarmed eyes, eyes that have seen what no, etc. Some somehow accepted into Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic, weird, countries where, before too long, they're given new, weird names, and there, picked on, picked last, left out, looked through, looked at, looked at too long, called slant or chink or nip or ching chong, eyes stretched to flatline squint, or told they stink, their house too, their food, what's that even in it? Hide your dogs, quick, whatever, ha, you don't belong, go back to where you came from. Or, Exoticized the girls, hello kittied, yellow faced, extolled for almond eyes and white adjacent skin, genetically slim with waists two hands could circumscribe as though designed for certain discernments, hypersexualized, and they are children. And the boys, the men, also in their yellow bodies, brawnless, gormless, beardless, or Fu manchu good at maths, computer games, maybe even Kung Fu, which, though, come on, in a real fight, in turn, desexualized. Never fully anything. Essentialized into nothing, ever orphaned from mother country and tongue. Generations of family and flowling net ropes of filial piety. Three degrees of piety, five foulings, where, what? We risk our lives and bring you here to study what is it, communications? Where you think you're so good, you can come here and say thank you to your parents? For cleaner guilt and adulteration, of course, chase the dragon, shoot the horse. Weird, this place, which these children know is no place, not their place, which has them represent. But who and what? What for? For if not white, nor are they of colour, not fully, more or less off colour, off white. Their concerns, like all things made in Asia, inferior, knocked off, mass manufactured, low rent. Think of the children, trying, playing their part, which is no part, or a rote, token part, a strenuous decor, to be praised, paid, patronised, their names mispronounced as though being done a favour. And they are, and thank you, really, for even trying, while being impressed upon re-Vietnam on our recent trip with its beautiful people, with their palm hats and their resilience, and I hope it's okay to say, their unbelievable capacity for forgiveness. And what, if not this, is assimilation, though not acceptance, no amount of East-West fusion achieves that. Having it, all of it, be okay, I suppose. Accepting it all, forgiving all, taking heed and being sensitive to all. 
being unbelievably composed above all. Composed. Thank you. I forgot to say, in addition to um, publishing the boat, the uh, phenomenal book of short stories, Nam also wrote a critical study of an Australian writer, a uh, fiction writer named David Malouf. So I'm going to start off with a question about what can poetry do that fiction can't and vice versa, since you know them both very well. Oh, thanks, Natasha. Um, it's funny because I've, I've been thinking about this and my, my answer seems to change with, you know, with the day, with the mood, with the season, with the time. Um, there's a part of me that thinks that what, what was happening when I was writing prose, especially after the boat, um, was that so much of what I was doing with the sentences was trying to create a sense of authority to create a sense of, you know, I know what I'm talking about, of certainty and come with me um, so that the carriage of the sentence could carry the ideas and what, what was embedded in them. And I think with this work and this territory especially, the idea of communicating that I knew what I was talking about, communicating coherence or fixity, let alone certainty, um, seems like it would not be um, you know, in the, D in the DNA of the thing at all. It would be totally at odds with it. And so I think in part it was a measure of um, creating a structure or a form or a way of doing, some, uh, doing things where I could have continual flux and change um, and things sort of looking different from different vantages and things meaning a lot of different things and contradictory things as well. And sort of putting my own self doubt and my own um, self indictment into it, and sort of just implicating myself in the thing too. That's a great, that's a great answer. What about um, readers and listeners? Do you have a sense of how their experience is different in a poetry reading versus a, a reading of, of prose fiction? Yeah, for sure. Um, so many different ways, I think. But one of the ways is that when readers that I've known um, and readers that I, I'll send my work to, you know, early as well, who are who I I, I just respect and admire, and um, their brains are, you know, crazy brilliant. When I send poetry to them, especially this book, there's a sense that. Um, it sometimes comes back with a sense of apology almost for not quite um, feeling as though they quote unquote get it or a sense of apology because they had thought they got it and then when they reached a different point in the poem or the line or the book, they would then reconsider what they'd gotten um, previously and to me, when, when I would receive this feedback, I'd be over the moon. It would be, this is exactly what, this is exactly what I'm going for because this is, in a way, it's the mimetic enactment of what's happening in my brain and what I'm trying to create in the brain of the poem as I'm doing it. Having a sense that, yeah, you know, you, you should be able to think with some certainty. Okay. That tone is definitely, let's say, sardonic. And the attitude behind it is one of anger, let's say. Um, and the references that are being made are to this and that. And then just, you know, slightly move the prism around and then think, oh, hang on, maybe I was wrong about that. Or maybe it wasn't solely that. Or maybe it was that, um, you know, compounded by its opposite at the same time. And so that, 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 that idea of having a structure that can accommodate, um, all of these conflicting energies felt like this was why it had to be in this form. Um, a related question is the audience for poetry. Oh, my wife and I have been to events here for fiction writers, and they crowd the whole place. This is, you know, um, 
was it Milton who said, a, a, a small audience, though few, or a fit audience, though few? So the audience for poetry is absolutely smaller than the audience for prose fiction in the United States. I don't know about other places. But um, how do you, do you think about not just your first readers, but the people who will buy your books or come to your readings? It, is it somehow disappointing that there are fewer of us who uh who who love poetry and are okay with being in that space of not knowing and being in that uh, space of constantly revising their ideas about what's going on um i i feel so i feel so uh lucky in um I hate the word with my career so far mm -hmm. um in the sense that you know i've been able to do what i have largely wanted to do and have it still you know out there um and i'm so grateful to my readers and to those who have you know continued to to give the work um, a life beyond release but that said i don't really think about that reader or the readers at all okay. when i'm writing um if if I, yeah, I've sort of, it's, it's been an interesting phenomenon because as you know, a lot of poets, um, have been and do move into prose. The other way around. The other way yeah. around. And I think that's a, um, it's a really tonic and, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and tremendous thing for the, mm -hmm. for the form. It doesn't really happen so much the, the other way around, does it? No. And, um, my, my publisher in Australia, when I sent it to him, said, well, at least, you know, you can't be accused of chasing the big bucks now. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of anyone who did it, and I, I couldn't. I couldn't. Yeah. Ah, uh, her poems aren't very good. Yeah. I mean, she's she's a fiction writer, and and she has no sense of she she no sense of form. You know, the poems are like chopped up prose. There's there's there are simultaneous practitioners. Uh huh. Um, like Margaret Atwood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although. Yeah. She stopped yeah. writing poems. Yeah. But and then Michael Ondaatje. Right. Was, was wonderful. Uh huh. Dennis Johnson was great. Oh, he yes. Wrote. Yes. Obviously, I don't know which came first. But he stopped. I think he, he wrote poems first. And I think then, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And then he stopped once the books right. took off. Yeah. The um, novels took off. It was hard, Natasha, to be honest, because, um, you know, one doesn't like to admit um, extraneous or especially commercial interests mm -hmm. you know into the space where one is trying to write um but of course you know your brain is your brain and it's pretty you know porous and so things do sort of bounce around and get through but i i really had to fight for this book to come out because um you know the specter of of industry did impose itself and this was obviously not what publishers would want to publish, especially so long after um, my last book here. And so, you know, I'd written pretty much a collection's worth of other poems, and there was no intention in me to publish those before the novel because it felt to me like I've done them, they can wait, and I'm willing to defer to the people who have, you know, stood by me and published my book and given me a chance. But when, when I wrote this, there was a sense that, no, this is an important for, book for me now mm -hmm. because it it just nails not nails it captures um for the moment something about how i'm feeling now about writing um both mine and 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 writing in general about the ethics and the aesthetics of the thing and it also contextualizes the stuff that i've written in the past as well as hopefully the stuff that i'll mm -hmm. i'll write to come as well so it was really important for me that this mm -hmm. book um come out and I did have to you know to take some risks how did you how did you convince them um I don't want to go into it too too, too, detailed. too detailedly just, but just I will say bit. I will say that the um you know there was there was one call, one phone call that I had with my um, lovely agent where he was saying oh just this morning we've had I've been on the phone with Regan Arthur the um, CEO of Penguin Random House and this is in 21 I think and they're canceling contracts, um, which was something that they were going through at the time. And of course, my 
my novel um, is super late, so they could easily, uh, you know, see that or assert that as a breach and then cancel that. And then that that would have come with potential financial disastrous consequences too, of, uh-huh. you know, paying back advances and then um, publishers overseas would then follow suit, et cetera. Uh-huh. And so this was right. sort of, you know, this was the advice, which was, you know, his job and really good advice. But having thought about it and talked about it with um, my partner for a day, um, that's when it sort of really consolidated itself as a decision in mm-hmm. me. Like, mm-hmm. you know, there's nothing like risk to really mm. um, firm up your values, I guess. Mm-hmm. And I felt very, very um, certain that I that I wanted to try. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd lost my editor at Knopf at the time because uh, she she um, left the the field, and so I was kind of orphaned in the industry and um, all of the noises that I'd heard um, from him and from other people was that don't, I mean, don't even try. Like it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's carnage out there Mm -hmm. in in the poultry world in terms of publishing and things are backed up till 25, 26, et cetera, et cetera. Uh So yeah, I mean, I, I basically um, thought about it and then resolved to do it and asked him to send it to Knopf thinking that if they, when they rejected it, then I would sort of take it off his hands and mm-hmm. try to find some I'll other sweat. way to do it. Mm-hmm. But then um, luckily, John Freeman, um, who I didn't even know was at large um, at Knopf, who's also a poet um, and an amazing um, curator uh-huh. um, of all things literary, he he um, he connected with it. He so, liked it. Yeah. Yes. And so he took it I'm on. curious, did he have any suggestions? It's so good. I mean, it's like each poem is perfect. I can't, and that's not something I usually think when I read a published book of poems. I'm really, I'm so critical. glad this is this is on camera. Yes. This is great. I'm, gonna... <laughs> I'm really critical. Yeah. I'm always finding some something to complain about, yeah. even in my own work. I, re- I reread it, oh, you know. But um, did he have any suggestions that you remember? He did, and um, it was interesting because. So some of some of my earlier readers had had some suggestions, and a couple of them were sort of larger scale ones in terms of um, like a whole poem that didn't didn't do enough, like it wasn't valenced enough, really? and so I got rid of it. Okay, um, they were right. John's suggestions were more. Um, there were some sm- there were some smaller, you know, micro level line edit ones, and a lot of them I thought about steaded. And then some of them I um, deferred and agreed to and changed it. And then in subsequent pages, I changed them back, <laughs> pretty much all of them, uh-huh. because I just felt like, yeah, you know, um, I can see your argument for this and it totally, I can understand it. But the, you know, the, the, the rhythm, the noise, the sense in my head uh-huh. had already sort of like um, coalesced around a certain uh-huh. thing. So uh-huh. one of the examples, let's just say, yeah. was um, in 11, violence, Anglo, Anglo-linguistic, where there's a line where Vietnamese says, I am um, manyness at once. And John said, you know, maybe maybe that's a, you know, a tautology and maybe you need to just like kill the at once. Yeah. And I went through all these sort of metaphysical, ontological yeah. um, excursions in my brain sort of going, oh, well, is manyness always at once? And is what does at once mean? And, mm-hmm. and then I sort of like thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to give in for other reasons because there were, there's a sort of, um, a three beat, like a molasses mm-hmm. kind of um, rhythm that goes through the poems. And I thought, well, that would at least bring that up. And then it just niggled at me for mm-hmm. forever. And then when I came back to it, I am openness, manyness at once, ontology. I needed the at once, you know, both rhythmically, but also in the way in which it uh-huh. it, 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 it folded the sense for me. Uh-huh. Um, and then there was an interesting, I don't think he would mind me saying, but there was an interesting larger note that he had um, about, you know, I wonder whether this book as a whole needs um, one more lyric in it. And I I wrote back and I said, can you explain what you mean? And he thought about it for a bit and he wrote back um, something that I won't go into. Uh But then I, I thought about it a little bit and it was funny because to me, the entire book is a meditation on the lyric Uh as well. It's a, Uh um, it is as much a forensic 
examination of the lyric as it is, um, you know, the forms mm-hmm. of diasporic poetry. Mm-hmm. And so I, I kind of worried a lot and then I formulated my thoughts into some sort of coherence and I made to write back to him and I said, Hey John, um, you know, can we talk about this? Um, you know, I've, I've had some thoughts. And then he, before, before we even got into it, he wrote back and he said, I actually, now I've been thinking and, um, ignore that last note because, you know, I totally, I, I don't think that's right at all. Like I think, uh-huh. I think what, I can't remember the, the thing, but it was really lovely. He was saying, I think I have been, um, in the industry and, um, as a publisher and a poet, I've been sort of inured to seeing the lyric in a certain way and expecting certain things yes. and certain moves of the lyric that mm-hmm. most often sort of have a very identifiable connection with emotion, let's mm-hmm. say. And then he was saying, um, I think that what you're doing is not, not that, but it's trying to do other stuff as well at the same time. Mm-hmm. So that was a really, it was a beautiful note and a beautiful moment because I, I thought, he yeah, gets it. He gets it. He gets it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so good. Yeah. Um, you used, a, you use words that I have to look up in the dictionary. And the poet Maxine Cuman once said, um, when we were talking about, um, vocabulary, she says, I never want to make a reader have to turn to the dictionary in the middle of reading my poem. Uh, and I thought, oh, I, I don't know. That, that is not my, that's not my way. I don't mind. I, you know, I read, I read the book all the way through. And then maybe the third time I'll look up words in the dictionary. And I wonder, um, how do you use a dictionary when you write? And uh, do you have this experience of, um, diction and syntax being tools you have to exploit in poetry more than in prose. Yeah, absolutely. Although I try to do it in prose as mm-hmm. well. And yeah, I think if I had to choose one book um, to to live with, it would be the OED, you know, okay. because it just contains everything for me. Uh-huh. Um, I, so many ways to think about this. Um, I guess one, one reason is precision uh-huh. and i want to i want to i want the words to say what i mean um and in your work especially what mm-hmm. i love is the precision when it comes to um you know scientific language or terms of art as mm-hmm. well because i think that so much of that language not only is precise but it's also incredibly um metaphorically rich mm-hmm. and it's not it hasn't been rubbed, you know, down to the, down to the bone with, mm. with overuse. And so there is still a sense of, you know, what's, what's going on here. Like if you think about it, names of different body parts that have survived since, mm-hmm. you know, um, Hippocrates, some of those metaphors are, are still so mm-hmm. loaded and charged at the moment. So that would be another, um, reason. Another one is what you were alluding to before that a poem for me is so, fundamentally sonic as well and so it 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 doesn't matter so much if the sense is not always there you know that famous line of communicating Mm -hmm. for it means um if there is a sense that the thing is held together you know by all the other things that are going on in the fields of tension within a poem as well but i think the main thing to be honest is i i just i i have a a boy like, um, enchantment with language. I just love language. And from the youngest age, I would, um, I would be reading sort of not where I was meant to be reading. And every time I saw words that I didn't like, I didn't see them as a, as a goad or a challenge or a rebuke. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw them as, you know, part of this, this repository or this inheritance almost that was waiting for me. And that, because anyone can use any word in this language. And to me, that was um, an incredible gift. And so that enthrallment, I would, mm-hmm. I would hate to condescend mm-hmm. to my readers and sort of write um, by somehow um, castrating myself of that enthrallment. You know, yeah. I need my, my, my love and awe of the language to sort of be communicated as well. And maybe everyone here knows English has more words than any other language. Yeah. 
So if you look at uh, uh, translation dictionaries, the the side for French or and I don't know Vietnamese, but uh, I'm pretty sure Chinese is the yeah smaller. It's thin, and the English side is huge because. The English language is like this big bucket that uh, uh, permits everything that's thrown into it. And it accepts. It's a very generous language as opposed to others. So we're lucky that we get to, it's, you know. It is pure luck, isn't it? Yeah. You know, that's yeah. This, this motley, mongrel, huge, capacious, changeable uh -huh. protein uh -huh. language is ours, uh -huh. you know, and we can. Uh -huh. Waddle around, you know. Yeah, it's, and it's cool. and as um, you, when you were a child, you spoke Vietnamese. Yeah, yeah. And then English took over for you. Yes. Yeah, I mean that's one way of saying it. Probably the less charitable one would be Vietnamese just stalled for me. Okay. And I never learned how to how to read or write uh -huh. in Vietnamese, so uh -huh. it was always, um, you know, just kitchen Vietnamese, just with with family. Right. Um, for which I'm really grateful because a lot of people in my generation never even had that. Yeah. yeah. I remember I was six when I didn't learn English until I was in kindergarten. And it only took a year for English to dominate. German was my first language, the language I spoke at home. And uh, I, I had an American accent really fast. Um, I... Um, yeah, it was not a pleasure for me to read in German. Of course, I, you know, I only spoke it at home, so the reading was children's books. But yeah, it was interesting how fast English sort of colonizes you or, or captures you. Or, yeah. Uh, I don't want to take all our time. Uh, does anybody in the audience have uh, a question? You can you come up and use that mic. Thank you. This has been wonderful uh, listening to this conversation. Something you said early on, and you just passed it off like, oh, okay, this is what was going on, and you just went right on. But it absolutely stunned me when you talked about the transition from prose to poetry. And you said, well, when I started prose, of course, I wanted to establish my authority. And I, I just didn't expect that. I, I, I can hear the sense of it. I have the right to write these things. Um, it's okay. I can do this, and yet it made me think about how often when I have taken on new things, and perhaps I was in a male-dominated career, and it, doing it in a male-dominated um, forum, my authority <laughs> was a very big deal. And I thought about other times in life, and I would like to invite you, um, there's, a, there's a superficial level where you want to establish your authority, I'm worth reading, but I'm wondering with your background and then writing in English, if you could talk a little bit more about what you were thinking in establishing your authority. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, there are, there, are, there, are, there are so many tracks <coughs> excuse me, um, down which I could go. I think I think there is there is still um, a tendency for for writers who write from the margins, let's say, and I know that's a very complex sort of thing because the industry itself is trying um, to center these voices and has succeeded in many ways, but there is still a, an enormously powerful um, and un unconscious potentially um, force or belief that someone who looks like me or comes with a place or a you know a face like mine that if they're good at English um, that it's not intrinsic somehow it's not innate it's not um, something that is natural it is something that's seen as being somewhat um, artificial or industrious, or like just virtuosically imitative. It's not seen as um, something you wouldn't ask, you know, everyone, or you wouldn't remark on the same things with someone who was very much in, in you know, in, in, the, in the mainstream. And I remember a friend of mine was writing a piece on Nabokov, and he asked me, you know, what's, what's he to you? you know, what, what do you reckon? 
And I thought about it for a bit. And it was, and I, I realized that it was because Nabokov went into language, you know, so deeply and playfully. And he, 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 it was a game as well to him, like the most serious game of all, but it was a game in which he was just using all of the, the valencies and the sounds and the etymologies, um, of English because it wasn't his first language. And he did it with enormous dexterity and skill. And he became one of the foremost practitioners of the language, obviously. But the, the skill and play that he managed to evince in his work was largely not seen as being something that was, you know, performed or put on. It was just like, well, this is his mantle and now he's coming into it and he's taking it on. Um, and it gave me some people like that really attracted me because it gave me a sense of permission or authority to, you know, that there was a way for me, um, you know, to, to, to sort of go make my way through and have a sense of concordance between I, I loved the language. I loved the language. Um, I was reading more than anyone at school and I felt like, you know, I had, I'd, I'd, I'd proven myself, let's say at school in the English language. And yet the presumption was always, oh, well, you know, you're good at maths and science. That must be where your real sort of, um, skill is or your wheelhouse is. And so uh, sorry for being so, so long winded and rambly. Um, I don't like to see myself as a victim of this because I feel like it has been um, a gift and an impulsion on my part that that I you know, am grateful to have gone through. But I do think that this sort of like overriding sort of cast or complexion of what virtuosity looks like in someone you know who looks like this or comes from this versus someone who looks like this and comes from that is something that we haven't really. Um, interrogated all that much. Another question? Someone else have a question? I have more. You? Yeah, I've got a Thank question. You. Um, so first, just a quick comment. I think Borges wrote poetry and prose his whole life. Uh, and I, so... Um, but speaking on the authority, um, your poem about children, the last one that you read, was incredibly moving. <laughs> and I really felt that there was a sense of vulnerability, which gave you also a type of authority um, in that poem. Um, and so with that as my context, my question is, I'd love to know your thoughts on the language we use surrounding refugees. And the word refugee, especially with situations going on in Ukraine and Gaza um, and with many countries right now <clears throat> wanting to curtail the um, definition and qualifications of the word refugee. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think there is a structural condescension in how we think and speak about refugees. I think part of that comes from a disjunct in us, and by us I mean people in the West, let's say, whereby we don't want to interrogate the arbitrariness of how it is that we've lucked into our situation. And there's also a sense of arbitrariness about um, just the modern configuration of the nation state arrangement as well and how everything now is sort of like folded into nationality and nationalism um, that creates its own sort of vectors of belonging or tribe um, and then that sort of promulgates itself through culture and um, politics as well and I think that it's not in anyone's interests um, the people who who um, get on fine with this system to really question this, you know, and I think we're so inculcated that we can't really question it. Like I, I will, I will cheer on the Australian women's football team with everyone else in the country when that happens, because that's just 
you know, that, that goes deep. And I'm not going to be, you know, the guy that's like, oh, but let's think about the, you know, the Westphalia system of nation states, you know. But that said, I do think that on there's, there's a shallow level, I guess, where wherein we, um, we think that by so-called humanizing refugees and refugee narratives that we're doing a wonderful thing um, without realizing how much that normalizes the, the enormous and chronic differential between us and them. And it also instantiates and confirms the us and themness of the situation because then what ends up happening is refugees fall into a script, don't they? And that script is that um, if they make it to where they're going, then they they should be grateful for their luck. And that happens to be both hard to swallow, but also inordinately true, you know? And that destiny of acceptance becomes character in the national script as well, whereby, you know, that's that's your job as a refugee is to um is 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 to be what we have allowed you to be. You know, and there's a sort of space that's carved out, but it's not obviously the same space that or scope that's accorded to everyone else. So I mean I think there are there are different um levels um on which we we can think and talk about it. And if you want it to be pragmatic, then of course I would I'd say, yeah, there are there are very solid um things that we can do, such as humanizing, such as looking at justice in a more um holistic way. But I think there is beneath that there's a whole morass of you know of stuff that we don't really want to unpick because then we're unpicking ourselves as well. Uh, that's brilliant. I've uh, I really appreciated that. It's uh I I just uh your poem you mentioned uh getting the mind of the poem. Um and I feel like uh in your work you there was the whole morass was brought out like I don't know, it was just really wonderful. You brought up something that in in moving through that poem, the the images and the voices that all moved together brought up so many different types of feelings and thoughts about what goes on below the spectrum of our political discourse and terms. So just thank you for for that. I was really I appreciate great. that. And I should say for like for my own um um you know ability to sleep at night that that poem for me is also it's it's very much also like um a like a self indictment or an indictment of a certain kind of um script as well so yeah. it's like we definitely reacting against um the ease with which um let's say diasporic writers um can deliver what is expected of them as well so it's almost like you want you want tropes you want all the stuff that um you might see on your sort of you know social activism um channels i'll give it to you i'm gonna pile it on as well but i wanted to have that very much um you know entwined with like a a deeply serious um and meant and hopefully vulnerable um account as well and authoritative like yeah it didn't yeah uh, so I just, i'm gonna leave now so I appreciate it. <laughs> we have time for one more question okay. Hi, so I'm an uh, undergraduate student studying creative writing and poetry, and I just got into like a whole argument with my roommate yesterday about a poem by Ocean Vong, which Vong takes the, it starts with the excerpt of a newspaper where a queer couple is burned alive, and the poem is taking the perspective of that queer couple as they are dying in the house. And we were having an argument on is it appropriate to use other people's tragedy to deliver a message? Um, and I kind of want to know like what your opinion is on that. Cause I'm also Vietnamese. I'm writing a collection right now for a class on like my family's trauma. And so like, what is my space in using events that didn't happen to me? And is it like you said earlier, like since it's in my blood, does that give me authority to talk about it against other events which some people might feel the need to use it as like a political statement. Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think, um, I think it's going to remain that to be honest, because I think the only answer that I have for you is just 
to keep the question alive. There is no resolution um, for me uh, with that. That poem and those lines, you know, um, hold to trauma. Um, for me, they contain the whole gamut of attitudes and tones. Like I feel, you know, enormously, I wouldn't even say conflicted. I feel enormously conspective about, about that. And it depends on who's saying it and what tone they're saying it in too. You know, I will take the, the opposite sort of line depending on um, all sorts of things. I think, um, I think the question of, you know, in the, the last line of that poem where it says, for it is written in the very walls of yourselves, to me that holds a, a field of, um, of different things together. And those different things don't, um, don't live together very well. So, of course, one interpretation of that would be the epigenetic interpretation. And this has been scientifically um, you know, studied and seemingly verified that, um, that trauma can be isolated and seen in the genetic expression of survivor's offspring. You know? um, but a cell is also a place where you're put and you can't get out of. And that's also the dilemma for you know the writer who seeks to capitalize let's say on um, their the ancestral or cultural or family trauma because you know there is an there is an infrastructure now whereby that is not just permitted um, it's rewarded as well and it's expected so that's also like a, you know it's a cell it's a bind it's a double bind um, and I think too like on a personal level um, of my dad who um, who was in a re-education camp for three years. And I think of how the Viet Cong cells consisted of three people and it was done for a reason. It was done because when you have three, you are always worried that the other two are conspiring and or colluding against you. And that sense of being permanently, structurally, suspicious, unsure, unfooted, um, feels to me, you know, also consonant with, you know, my experiences of this, this exact question. Um, so the, I don't have an answer, but I guess I would just say to you, um, what I say to myself, which is the, the big thing that matters is you keep on sort of just taking the question seriously. I'm going to add a little codicil to that. I've worried about this in in p other people's poems in my own, and I find that it helps to think, I think Kant said, it's okay to use people if they have agreed to be used. Like a doorman opens the door, he's getting paid for it, or she's getting paid for it, and they are in a role, so you can use them. But when you're using someone else's story uh, and you don't have their permission, and it's clear you're using it for your own benefit, then the reader feels very icky. I ha actually have an essay uh, on this topic called The Eth Ethics of in Poetry. So maybe that'll help you with the, the, the roommate. Um, it, it's so often I read things. In fact, I don't remember that poem by Ocean Mong, but others where I, it feels icky. Uh, and that is a sign that, you know, my body is, is rejecting this use in the poem. Yeah. I love the fact Time. that you just, you know, yeah. here's something I prepared earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well. Um, well, thank you everyone so much for coming out to the event tonight. We'll be doing personalizations. Let's give our author and moderator a big round of applause.